Hey everyone, this is Mike Matsuno. This is the Man in Japan channel, and I'm here with Maggie Sensei, Margaret Yokota from Germany. And today she's my guest. And I know a lot of people have wondered about living in Japan or being a foreigner in Japan, some of the, the trials, some of you know the good as well as the bad. I decided to start on a new type of podcast video where I get special guests, especially special friends, like you know, Maggie has been a special friend for 30 years, and just to get some of their input. Because 30 years in Japan is a long time. She's married, she has a family, she married a Japanese gentleman, she has children. And so today we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll give her a chance to share maybe two or three things that she really loves about Japan and maybe two or three things that maybe she doesn't really like so much. Maybe she'll give you a cross-cultural perspective as well as she's from Germany originally, so she can give you that perspective, you know, how that affects her viewpoint and what she thinks now after 30 years. So, Maggie, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. And hello, everyone. So, Maggie, uh, maybe we can start. We met 30 years ago teaching English at the GOS, our friend Yoshi Iwata's school in Kyoto. And after that, you got married and I kind of left Japan. So can you fill us in what happened after since 30 years ago? Give us a short summary of what has happened in your life. Wow. How much time do you give me? <laughs> 30 years? So I was 23 at that time. I was teaching English uh, to kids mostly. I had a few adult classes but mostly for kids. I got married and I moved from Kyoto to Shiga Prefecture, which mm -hmm. is right next to Kyoto. The biggest lake of Japan, Biwako, right. is here right next to me. We had our first son one or two years, years later. So I have three children now. The oldest is 25, 22, and 20. With the second child, I stopped uh, teaching at that school in Kyoto, but I always kept teaching privately. And I shifted more and more to just teaching kids. Then we bought a house right next to the lake. So we have this house now. And then once my oldest son got into school, I started to peek into school a uh, very new experience for me to experience what growing up in Japan really means and I tried to be as involved as possible and then I offered at that time there was no English curriculum at all in elementary schools which means up to up to grade six and then I offered to voluntarily teach the kids in elementary school because my mornings were off. The kids were in school or in kindergarten. My job was teaching kids. I had opened my own language school, but because I was just teaching kids, I was teaching after the kids got home from school, which means four or five o'clock. So my mornings were free. I see. So I offered to teach in elementary school just to get an experience myself, this school culture. And they were happy about that. I taught 400 kids in one year. Wow. Uh, because we were a really huge school with many classes at that time. And they loved it. And from there, it got a job, another job aside from my own school. And I, I taught in elementary school for 10 years. Wow. And that was really a wonderful time where I could really dive into it all, I would say. Because education, I think, is one of the main things that create a culture. Also one of the main things that can change certain things in a culture, I guess. That were those 10 years. And then they started to have English in elementary school as a school subject. And it was very contradictive to what I was doing. And so... I stopped teaching there. I just put more focus into my own school and I did all kinds of stuff. I did uh, teacher training, classes for parents. So there were adults, but not as I'm teaching adults to speak English. It was more educative, yeah. enjoying at the same time, enjoying and sometimes a little bit suffering from uh, seeing my own kids grow and uh, running through the whole system with them, junior high school, senior high school. So they, they did all their education here in Japan, university, and now they are starting to fly out to Germany here and there. So can yeah. I ask you a question then? So yes? when you were raising them, did you raise them in Japanese or German? German or English or what language did you speak when you raised them? That's an interesting question. So my first son, you know, Kai, I talk German 
want to. For a while, his German was better than his Japanese, actually, because we also went to Germany for a couple of months in between. Then his brother was born. When Kai was three, his brother was born. And the two always only talked in Japanese. And of course, oh. all of Kai's friends were Japanese. So, right. and he would play a lot. He would always have his friends oh. over. And I would talk in German to Kai, but everyone else was talking Japanese. Oh. And so the, the brothers always were talking Japanese. And then it went on like this until Kai, he got into elementary school. And there I felt that it started that he came back from school and he wanted to tell me something. He was all excited because of something good or bad or whatsoever had happened in school. He wanted to tell me this, but then suddenly he noticed because I talked to him in German, I would say, you know, schön, dass du wieder hier bist oder whatsoever. And then he would realize, oh, I'm supposed to talk in German. And he would, I could see he oh, closing his shutters. Interesting. And he would say nothing. But then I would, if something bad, like once he had been kicked by someone for something stupid and he wouldn't tell me, he, I saw something bad had happened, but he wouldn't tell me. And there I thought I really need mm. to change something. And I was talking in Japanese to his brother because, you know, he never talked German. Uh, and wow. so I thought he must feel really weird. Uh, and that was the point where I decided, you know, I want to take being a mother to him before being his German instructor. So I want our relationship is more important to me than his education, I see. which I probably shouldn't say as an educator. <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, then he ended up speaking Japanese to yes. him. So his German now is still... His German now, it's, it's every day. So he, we, we went back pretty often and he, whenever he went back, he was able to speak German. And so it's every day when he goes there, he can, he can communicate. And the second one, he went to Germany just this spring to enter university there for another degree. And when he went, he, he hardly couldn't speak any German at all. Oh. Like even the numbers were like, Hey, <laughs> I was surprised really. But then he improved so quickly. It was amazing. And now he can, you know, sometimes we go on Zoom purposely saying, okay, today we'll have a Zoom only in German. We will talk only in German. And he really can, you know, he can talk politics. He, he, he really wow. can talk and say what he wants to say in German, which is good for half a year. So I th think somehow he got a certain amount of input and maybe right. there are some genes or whatsoever the second one is the one that after six months in germany yeah. he was able to kind of yeah. so yeah he probably has been around been influenced probably yeah. he, you know he heard he heard some of you when you were talking to friends or whatever yeah. in german so you have the two boys that are in germany right now is that what you're saying the Jer middle is in germany and until next week the oldest is also in germany just I for see. a few weeks did they go like on a roots kind of journey that they thought that they should find out because they're half german that they should go and find out more about germany i don't know if it's like uh find out more about germany but uh they definitely had like connect to the family your family like, is all living in germany uh one sister is living in greek yeah connect to the family my parents are already they're dead but yeah. like my brothers and sisters and so on yeah and then i guess it's also this you know their roots and they want to be a little bit of a kakehashi a bridge between germany and japan that's great because even though i didn't speak german to them and i grew up catholic Oh, really? But Interesting. In a, in a very rural, rural, very, very small village. So I had to go to church every Sunday and I grew up Catholic, but I'm none of religious. So I go to temples and shrine and my family, it's now it's everything. Like many traditions come from religion, right? Our Christmas or Easter we had here in Japan, I think naturally I created them the German way, even though in Japan it's more American way and yeah, more, like, more commercialized. You know, right, right. Yeah. But uh, I think they got lots of German culture from me through songs or through other stuff. And I think that's the things where they think what they want to connect with. So mainly you were speaking English to your family. You were teaching, sorry, you're speaking Japanese to your family. You were teaching English. So you weren't really teaching German in Japan, but they 
you know, I, picked it up. I always have a student once in a time. I have yeah. one now as well. And so can you tell me a little bit about okay, your husband? You got married about almost 30 years ago. International marriage. You know, a lot of people, you know, you see on different YouTube videos or you see, you know, some are go really well, some don't go really well. But you seem that can you tell us uh, some of the the challenges or or the good things or you know, when you first met your husband, I'm sure it was love that you fell in love and got married. Is that correct? Yes. That was your decision that you're going to stay in Japan at that point? Or were you thinking? No, that was before that. So I was in Japan and the, the first half year, I just wanted to go back. I wanted to go back. I wanted oh. to go back. And I was in Kumamoto in Kyushu, you know. And you then were studying I, at a university at that time? Yeah. Okay. And nothing went well. And then I came to Kyoto uh -huh. and I lived in this beautiful place in between a temple and a dozens of shrines and like like momiji and uh, maple leaves and a uh, view on the daimojiyama yeah. view on the tokyo tower and everything wow so it was just so japan japan so like everything expect from japan was every day in front of my eyes this is in Kyoto. You're living in Kyoto. In Kyoto. Okay. So on the day I moved into this apartment, I was just like, I might never be able to go back to Germany. Really? Wow. It was that powerful, huh? that experience. It was very. And then I met you. <laughs> <laughs> experience of, you know, working, having a great job with wonderful colleagues and um, also international. And I was... Uh, learning Japanese dance. Tell me something like, you know, you're German and just I'm from outside looking in. I don't know. And maybe you can share some of your um, your viewpoint that, you know, the German mind and the Japanese mind seem to be quite different as far as the independence, the kind of critical thinking, the kind of speaking your mind. Can you tell me like what are the major differences between German and Japanese from your point? Of you well this this comes already to the last question oh, a little okay. bit <laughs> okay okay go, go ahead let's go go ahead in germany one thing that looking back now always bothered me and always bothers me still is that you always have to have an opinion on everything oh interesting and like from kindergarten on, from little on, you always have to have an opinion. You have to state your opinion and people just state their opinion. To me, I'm not a person like that. So I always felt under pressure. I, I always felt stressed. It was never that I, you know, you, you, you haven't, you can think about something slowly and make your opinion on something or maybe have an opinion but not state it it's just impossible oh interesting it's always why why <laughs> barum, barum. <laughs> and that was something that was really tough for me and then i come to japan and so if people ask me this simple question i mean there are um, i have many answers to what do you really love about japan but one of the first answers i've always given was i feel so free i've oh. never felt so much freedom in all of my life i think one part is this like in germany i always had this if i do this I will ask, I will be asked why I'm doing this. If I go here, I will be having to justify why I'm going here. So it's always, and, and everyone would ask you whether it's good friends or whether it's someone you just met on the streets, you know. I think for someone like my oldest brother is a person who is very, very strong and very, I don't care about what others think about me or anyone. So if you are have a personality like that, then it's fine, right? You can you can come big and right. it's really good. But I was a kid until senior high school. I always had bad marks in um, like the amount of time you raise your hand or, you know, you, you, you participation you points. Yeah. yeah. So, and uh, it, it's always like, she's so silent. We often don't know whether she's there or not and so on and so on. But I always, you know, I'm a person who is thinking, right? I'm, I'm not, I'm not dumb. I'm that really put me behind barriers and then here in japan it's like 
it's so free, you know. Uh, I can that, state my opinion, but I can also just be quiet. That is so interesting because most foreigners would probably, or Westerners would say just the opposite, right? That they feel so constricted and, and, and that they have to follow the rules of Japan. But for you, it was reversed and it was a sense of freedom. Yeah. So do you think that your personality fits the, the Japanese culture and society or value system better than in Germany? Yeah. <laughs> So do you think that was just in your DNA or in your personality? And that's the reason? I mean, I don't want to say that I'm not German at all. So sometimes I find myself being, uh, oh, that was really German. Because, of course, I have run through the German education system and I've grown up uh, that way. So I also have these parts where I'm asking too much, why are you doing this or that? Or where I'm, you know, oh, I, I'm just telling someone to do something which I shouldn't be doing. But I think in general, I'm much more Japanese. And so when you raised your family and your children as they as through the years, then you raised them more in a Japanese type of style. Yeah, I like naturally not thinking about it. There's another thing that I think really, I mean, not making this a bad mouthing about Germany, but one of the uh, things where I think are really, really sad, sad for me about Germany is that like Germans uh, don't say sorry. Oh, really? Oh, I and didn't know that. also like thank you is a word like. You know how Japanese people say uh, are sad to say sorry all the time and thank you all the time. Right, right. But I, I've met like all the Americans or Canadians uh, or Australians, New Zealanders, like also native English speakers. I've met. It's always thanks for the other day. Thanks for the for the dinner we had the other day. It's always this. It's not only Japanese, I think. Maybe it's because I meet these people in Japan. I don't know. But in Germany, you would never thank one, someone for a party the other day or for something someone did the other day for you. You only say, thank someone for something that just happened in the morning, morning maybe uh, in this moment. And you never say, I'm sorry. You know, really? you never apologize. You you might say, mm, uh, that's too bad, but you don't get a pure apology. Yeah, yeah. And these are also things, I'm a person who, oh my God, I think I'm I'm very grateful. Like, and like, I just look outside and it's like, I'm living in this beautiful place again. I'm just grateful for what is around me, right? So, and that is something what I think I naturally gave to my kids as well. I mean, I think Americans may say the same thing too. I mean, Americans, you know, tend to be more um, vocal and, you know, they'll say thank you, of course, and 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 I'm sorry, but maybe not so much like thanks for the other day or thanks for last week, you know. Um, as much as, of course, Japanese would always remember because it's 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 very important that you remember what someone did for you before. So I think yes, there's there's a difference. And as you said, it could be that you met the American, the Canadians, and Americans in Japan, and they already have been kind of Japanified, yeah. or and so they just naturally say it. I, I do it a lot, you know, and you know I'm Japanese American, so I think that's also part within me or the way I was raised. But yeah, I think that uh, that that's very interesting. I did also feel like when I traveled, I think I forgot which country I was in. I think it was in in Central uh, America, in Guatemala, where people didn't use the word "I'm sorry" or you know um, so much "thank you." You know, it was only on special occasions, and people told me, "Oh, it, only when it's 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 re when we say it, we really mean it. So we don't just say it to." To, to you know just to go through the motion so that was the other side of that too right it was only said when you know someone really meant it so but yeah, yeah that that's interesting since we're on the subject what other things would you say now let's i, I wanted I, I had asked um maggie sensei here um mm -hmm. to share maybe a couple of things like maybe two you know two, two to three things that she really likes and maybe two or three things that she kind of bothers or she doesn't like so Anything else that is on the dislike column that maybe compared to Germany, you you feel that Japan does better and that you that you really like in Japan humbleness. So when we're talking about this, I really think it depends, you know, on the listeners who would 
who will take this. So if you come from America or if you come from an Arabian country or a South American country or a European country, you, it, it will, it always depends on what you compare it to. Correct. So if I Correct. say humbleness, Correct. someone else might say, ah, Japan, humble? Ooh. Compared to Germany and where I come from, it's like this, this humbleness is, is really something that uh, I'm still learning a lot to be humble and like, yeah, how, how Japanese people really are naturally humble and we are seeing it in the soccer again and again the other day. <laughs> So I'm completely uh, cheering like on Japan, right? So it was the first soccer World Cup or the first real soccer game against Germany, uh, German-Japan. And I, from the beginning, I was completely cheering on Japan. And uh, I, I actually, we did a YouTube video on this. Uh, That's with right, Kai, right. And I just, so what is the reason? And it's like this, like Germany... And ger like the German fans, as well as the German soccer players, there is just no humbleness. You know, it's there, there is this somehow looking down on certain teams. And yeah, and Japan has this humbleness. I think even if they play against usually weaker teams, Japanese people usually, and again, there are, of course, there are right, always right. exceptions, but Correct. Japanese people, I think, usually try to make the other person feel good especially not make them feel bad so after the german after that soccer game i had class the next day and i had all these little 10 year olds like uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know who love soccer they watched the game and when japan, when japan upset, upset Ger Ger germany uh, right? well, yes and they came in and they came into class and they they were like not mentioning soccer but there was no no way that you know it wasn't on their mind right 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 so after a while i said hey did you I watched soccer yesterday and very yes <laughs> and i said well japan won yes i said yeah <laughs> japan won eh? my dad said i shouldn't mention this to you at all and i was like why <laughs> yeah because you know you might be upset and you might be sad and and this was so cute you know they didn't yeah. want to make me sad oh. because and I said, no, I cheered on Japan. And then they were completely like, but you were born in Germany. How can you cheer on Japan? Ah. I met another uh, guy here. Actually, his son is playing for Real Madrid. He's going, uh -huh. he, he's in the top team. He's, he's, he's a pro soccer player. He's my neighbor. And uh, again, so I, I, I went on a walk and I met this, this dad. And I said, so yesterday, soccer was good, man. And he said, oh. I'm so sorry for <laughs> you. <laughs> so, yeah, not saying something huh. or saying something because we want to make the other person feel good or not feel bad. I think that is really something where yeah. which is also very, very opposite of German, where it's more ironical or, you know, on purpose saying something not to make you feel bad, but to tickle you and kind of tease you, right? Kind of kind of make bit. fun yeah, of you yeah, if, yeah, if yeah. you lost, if your team lost, right? Yeah. That is so cute. The 10-year-old kids were actually cute scowling or worrying that they didn't want you to feel bad yeah. so they didn't talk about soccer even it was probably one of the most exciting things for them yes. correct especially the upset yeah. against germany and their fathers had told them not to say to you as well as your neighbor who you saw was apologizing that ah you know you, sorry i <laughs> kind of sorry right yeah that is so cute yeah so interesting but yeah that is so japan you know the, the whole idea of being very humble and I think you may have read the article where when they left the um the locker room, they cleaned the room and they put little origami cranes that they left in a thank you note, I think it was. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. I think those are the the things that I go, wow, that's class. You know, that's class. I also really uh, admire that too. You know, um, the Japanese, they have a proverb. Uh, I don't remember it, but basically it means like, I did a YouTube short video on this where the rice stock, when as the rice becomes more and more ready to harvest, the more rice in the pod, the more it bends down. So basically saying uh -huh. the more... Or the smarter, the more brains you have, the lower you bow or the more humble you are. Something like that is kind of really represents Japan in a, in, yeah. in a especially more traditional ways. Yeah. Would you like to talk about a couple of things that maybe you don't like or bother you about Japan? A few more concrete things that I like okay. about Japan, maybe. Sure. 
Yes. Or should I go into the non-like Japan? No, no, no. You can just, just go ahead. Just go freely. Okay, so Whatever you feel. A, a more, more concrete things. Okay. Vegetables. Vegetables. Okay. Well, I don't know about the States. I guess you have a lot there, but you have a whole forest of mushrooms. You have the whole yeah. earth soil full of all kinds of yam roots and, and lotus roots and... Yes. Goya and all these like the chili, the chili types, the green ones, you know, yes. you have the, the, the bigger ones, the smaller ones, the sharp ones, the sweet ones. And it's like just vegetables. It's like, you know, most people know about omigyu or kobagyu. That's uh, the cows that right. are washed with beer. And I'm not a meat eater. So uh, I can't compete with that. I think that's great too. But my God, vegetables. So that's one thing, very concrete. In the United States, I'm not that savvy at cooking, but what I notice about Japan is the presentation. You know, like when you see their vegetables displayed, you know, they're almost like polished. They look so nice. And the, their display is so different from like back home in Hawaii, whether it's a Safeway or a, a Time supermarket. They're bigger usually in America and there's a lot of them, but it's not as well presented. So of course, Vegetables look much more tasty or much more attractive in Japan. What about for you? Is it the taste or is it the presentation or or what it's compared all, to? It's also it's first the variety really. Okay, it's amazing. Whether you go in summer and you have aubergines, you have all kinds of you have long ones, you have round ones, and so on. So it's the variety. I'm sure in the States you have more than we have in Germany, but in Germany it's really it's it's one type of of, of aubergines and one type of uh peppers and so on and so on. So more diversity in the different types yeah. of vegetables basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it's also the presentation and it's also the taste. Yeah. I mean yeah. and for example one thing uh, I go to a market here where there is really lots of local vegetables. So that means that there is also sometimes you find stuff with bugs in there. Yeah. But for example, I got uh, the amount of bugs. It's it's nothing compared if you would get a fresh thing in Germany. And so yeah. sometimes I get stuff from neighbors who farm their, themselves. Right. And I got this um, the the, the uh, white the China. China cabbage? Chinese cabbage, yeah. Chinese Napa, cabbage, I think we call it, yeah. Which usually has lots of, it, it's, you know, if it... If it's, insects and bugs in it. You yeah, know? yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. And it has nothing. Yeah. And I was like, and her mom had had made it in her garden. And I said, is she spread? What is she doing? What is she putting on it? Right, and she right. said, no, she is going at night with the torch and with chopsticks and she takes <laughs> it out. You're and kidding me. And then once me. she cuts it... And she, you know, she cuts it and takes it in. She, again, she goes with the chopsticks. But in the very beginning, when it starts to grow, to take it out, that keeps, you know, more insects to come. You mean that night she's going with the flashlight and yeah. and, and pulling the little bugs out of the, out growing, of the yes. growing Chinese cabbage? Yes. Oh, and then at the end, when she picks it, she still goes and pulls she out. But and, and oh my goodness, so, what and, service! <laughs> yeah, it's like that, you know. And you know, we know like the the the, the, the apples or stuff that's yeah. one each. Like so, of course, the taste is different. Well, the price is different too. But yeah, would you say yeah. that I found that the vegetables were pretty comparable with the United States, but fruits were always much more expensive in Japan. What did? You, what about you? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So the fruits are more are cheaper and more accessible um, in in, um, in Germany. But okay. I used to love fruits, but now when I go back to Germany, so I'm I'm looking forward like some things I'm always to I hardly buy at all in Japan like cherries or peaches. Yes, yes, yes. They are so expensive. Yeah, they are very so expensive. I went back to Germany these last years. I went a few more times, well, before Corona, of course. And every time I would be looking forward to nectarines or peaches or cherries. Yeah. And I would buy a lot and then yeah. I would eat them. And I was so disappointed of the taste. Oh, really? Why? Why? Because 
they all taste the same. It's very flat. The taste is very flat. And I don't want to say that each cherry tastes different in Japan, but it feels it feels almost like that. Like this year I got cherries from Yamagata, like yeah. really good ones. Yeah. Oh my God. So when you compare the cherries in Germany to the cherries that you got in Yamagata, completely different is what completely you're saying. Completely different fruit. And you can tell. You're just not I being biased. Tell. You can tell. So maybe... There is value in the cost, you know, like cherries are like yeah. two or three yeah. times the price easily, right? Yeah, yeah. The other concrete thing is Japanese baths. Okay, tell me about that. Uh, and that is for reason. Actually, until a few years ago, I didn't, uh, especially in summer, I wouldn't take a bath. I would shower. Okay. And in winter, I also would just shower. I started, you know, getting old. You get here and there. It starts hurting. Aches and, and pains, yeah. You know, here and there, something would hurt. And... Then my um, chiropractic, he said, you know, you you need to make the temperature of your bath hotter. And I was like, I, I don't bath that much in, around this time. In summer, I don't bath. It was in summer. You don't bath in summer. In summer, you have to bath even more because there's air conditioning and stuff. You have to take a bath in summer. Oh, really? So I started to be more regular on, yeah, just, you know, taking baths. And uh, I started to really enjoy in, in Japan, in these bathtubs, you know, you they, they are smaller. So uh -huh. you can't lie in them. You sit in them. But they come up to here. And then you can warm up the water again and again. If it cools down, you just push a button and one or two minutes and you have it again at the temperature you like. So I really like baths. And I also like public baths. Oh, you go to the sento, the public baths then? Well, you have, unfortunately, you have to... there is no sento anymore here in Katata. In Kyoto, I used to go where I live. I didn't have a bath at oh, all in Kyoto. So for the time when I lived in Kyoto, I went to the sento and... Uh, I love the Sento. And every foreigner who came to visit me from Germany the first day we had, to, I'm going to take it. The first experience was at the Sento. And what did most of them think? That was fine because, you know, that's not common in Germany, right? Everybody being common. naked it and was running weird. in. And they would re remind me of some things I hadn't even noticed. For example, like in, Kyo like, you know, in the Sento, there is the cashier where you pay. Right, right. In between, right? In the yeah. center, right? Yeah the female and the male right. cabin so you you look here and you see the naked women right. and you look here where you yeah. see the naked man and usually there was an old man who was doing the cashier yeah i hadn't noticed that <laughs> i hadn't noticed that i didn't care at all you know and like my sister came was like is this you don't care there there is a man sitting there and <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but, you know, but it's it's natural. That's just the way it is. And tell me about the bath for you now, now that you've taken, you take it in the summer and in the winter. What are some of the benefits? Is it more relaxing that you're able to sleep better? Or do you, are your aches and pains, are they, do they go away? Or what's the benefit for you? Yeah, there are certain, the like, like muscle muscle pains i used to get that uh have gone away that don't come anymore and um i sleep better even in the summer even if it's really hot you still take a bath because i don't because it's too hot in the summer but you still that's what your doctor said it's better yeah. to take a bath right yeah yeah oh, that's yeah. interesting i didn't yeah. know that that's vegetables anything else that are concrete um pluses for japan Great uh, Japanese soccer, I said already. And yeah. then, well, uh, seasons. So that is also something I don't know. I might have to change that one this year, actually. But uh, I just did a YouTube uh, two months ago where I talked with my son about this. Japan has clear seasons still. <laughs> okay. Uh, this year, it's different now. Nah? Right, I'm, I'm right. a little bit worried this year, actually. Wait, but, so in G Germany, I would assume, has four seasons. Well, there are four seasons, but like sometimes you have winters where it's where the winter is just very luke. Right. But more than that, you can have summers where it's really just 10 degrees during the whole summer. Oh, is that right? So, so nothing really distinct, not clear nothing cut. Nothing distinct. Well, usually it should be distinct, but yeah. it's... 
it's not, you know. Well, wow, that's interesting because, yeah, for Japanese, the word shiki, like four seasons, are so important, right? A lot of people used to come and visit me in Hawaii and they love Hawaii. I said, Yeah, you should move here and live here. And they said, Oh, we love Hawaii. We'd love to visit, but we couldn't because shiki, shiki ga nai. You don't have four seasons. And they missed yeah. that because the whole idea of, you know, changing the clothes, eating different foods, eating different, drinking different os osake or things. I think it's a, so this idea of shiki is really important in Japan, right? Yes. And that's what this year, so we have a beautiful autumn, right? And yeah. it's like, you would say, oh, it, if the whole year was like that, it would be, you know, beautiful sky, hardly any rain. Sometimes yeah. it rains, but the next time they, it will be fine again, 20 degrees, what more? Right. Um, but I, when can I put on my coat, you know? <laughs> uh, you're looking forward to winter, actually. Yeah, and also to the time to have a Saturday where it's too cold and too gray to go outside and to be allowed to just stay inside and snuggle up under the kotatsu. And it's really a little bit late this year. Tomorrow it's supposed to get a little bit colder. But And also this idea of Japanese, like the clothes, like yeah. you wear, you don't wear a coat, even if it would be a cold day in september right right you wouldn't wear a coat you know that that's taboo and uh so this fashion this sense for fashion yeah i i never thought it was logical right because it doesn't matter the temperature or anything it just depends on what the date october 1st or now maybe it's november 1st where men start to wear like the tie you yeah. know and then long sleeve <laughs> shirt right and then i think the, the date in summer i think it's may 1st but it didn't matter on the temperature or the weather it was just it was decided, right? Exactly. And Which is uh, completely unpractical, but it's it's somehow it's cute. It's very interesting. Like Kai tells this funny story when he was in Germany and it was like on a July or August day. It had been hot the whole time. But then there was this, there's always one day where it suddenly crashes like 20 degrees colder. Right. And it was so cold. But he thought it's summer, you know, I I cannot I cannot wear a jacket. So he went out in his T-shirt and he said, everyone around me was wearing down jackets. And I felt so cheated. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great story about really how the, you know, how the Japanese have been trained to think, right? Of the idea yeah. of there's a date and time and that's it right and yeah. then you you everybody changes from long pants to short pants to like the kids for school or whatever you know or vice versa but yeah that's really really a funny story and, and yeah it make it's perfect it makes perfect sense you know if you lived in Japan right and i'm just amazed that you look forward to the four seasons and even the winter like i don't you know i'm from hawaii so of course i'm thinking yeah the, we call it indian summer when the fall is really long right I, i'm just hoping that yeah fall will be forever but really so in that way you're very japanese and that's why you know like the idea of like when's winter coming you know put on put on the kotatsu sit underneath with the little you know i don't know hot chocolate or whatever but yeah that's really interesting anything else maggie sensei about well, four? very concrete what i don't like about japan okay very concrete thing is mosquitoes mosquitoes is that because you live kind of out in the country out by the lake did you get a lot or tell me about this have them in kyoto oh well i i had them when i lived in kyoto as okay. well but here okay. it's very bad oh really so, so but so what do you use? You use like the mosquito coil and then the, the liquid um thing to keep the mosquitoes. Uh, when away. I go outside, I use spray on my skin. Oh, really? That's the only thing that really works. What months are the mosquitoes? Is it summer usually? Summer, but the worst is end of October, beginning of November, when they start to, you know, lose their energy but still want to live. Yeah. They like you get bitten really, really badly. Really? Mm. Wow. No, I, I live up, you know, just south of Kyoto between Nara and Kyoto. And I don't have very much a problem at all. But again, I live in a kind of an apartment complex. I have a rice field behind, but yeah. you're the first person who I heard say that. Really? Anything, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. It must be the location, the water and, you know, being what, what else bothers you about Japan besides mosquitoes? There's not too much. Well, there there are a few things that are like that have like both sides. For example, okay. 
I like the fact that Japanese people, the, the kiyotsukao, so they really don't... Over, they over-worry, overly concerned? Over-concern or, for example, situations, I think what many foreigners misunderstand, but also many Japanese people then misuse. For example, I drop my keys and the person next to me sees I drop my keys and he like a German per person would right away go and pick up the keys for the person who dropped it. But in Japan, that would hardly ever happen, oh, right? Interesting. Yeah. They kind of just watch. Right? And and I, I think like, especially at least German people would say it's rude. The, the, yeah. They don't care about other people because uh, that's the good thing about yeah. German people. You know, they really also in a good way they care if, if they can help someone they help someone yeah. they, they yeah. i think german people are looking around all the time <laughs> for you know whether they can help someone or not. oh that's a really great thing that's a good it's, samaritan it's a great thing, but if it doesn't go too far you know <laughs> but it's a great yes it's a great thing that's a really good thing but then the Japanese people don't pick up the key because the person who dropped the key might be embarrassed about dropping the key and oh. might be embarrassed that somebody came and picked it up for him. This has happened to me. Like, you know, somebody who, who dropped something, dropped some money, and I would run and pick it up. And then that person was like, oh, my God, you know, I, I'm, I'm so sorry I bothered you. I dropped this money. And that's not I don't want them to apologize, you know. So, so you think that that's I was I was very curious about the reason that people don't do that. I yeah I, I agree with that. That people just seem to be like they don't want to get involved or whatever. But you think it's about not wanting to make the other person feel embarrassed and and and, and uh, have to apologize. So instead of giving them back their iPhone that they dropped or money, they just let it go. Yes, in really? many cases, yes. In many cases, yes. Oh, that's so interesting. I never even thought about it, but you are correct as far as I'm like 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 the German people. Whenever I see something drop right away, I go and pick it up and I take it to the station and I say, Oh, somebody dropped this or whatever. Or somebody just the other day, somebody, oh, it was one thousand yen on the on the escalator. I was coming up the escalator and I found it and I it was getting caught in that at the end. I grabbed it and then I, I was thinking what to do with it. And here comes a lady running back. And I said, Oh, is this yours? And she said, Oh yeah, thank you. You know, but she was very thankful that, you know, she, she you know, for, 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 but I, I'm like the, the German people are just a natural instinct to, you know, do, but I am so, in, that is so interesting what you just said. So people would I've, rather. Also, I've seen it a lot, like on the train, like, you know, I see someone and then I stand up and offer my seat. Right. I don't know if that has happened to you that you offer the seat to someone who is older or who, yeah, who yeah. might, well, it's not to me to judge it, but yeah, right, would, right, right. you know, but they refuse it. Yeah. And I think it has happened to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, they, I, refuse I, I, it. they don't want to set. And some of them are reason even upset that. You, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, it's this situation, you know. Oh, I think that's the reason why many people don't do it. That is so interesting. Oh, you know, it, yes, that has happened to me where you, you offer your seat and they don't. And then it's an awkward situation because now you can't just sit, go back and sit down because that would be rude, right? But you can't, they don't take the seat. So that's kind of yeah. rude. And it's like, it's kind of awkward, right? So normally yes. what I do is I offer the seat. I have to walk away. I have to walk down to the, like, the next the next car just to get out of there because either which way, whether they sit or they don't, it's just, I don't want them to feel if they sit, I don't want them to feel like apologetic or feel bad. But on, on the other hand, if they don't sit, I don't want to be like, so I just offer the seat and I just walk away because that's the only way I get around that situation where you yeah. offer the seat and you stand there, they feel embarrassed or they said no, or they get mad as you said, because they feel they're not that old and on and on and on. Right. But recently, maybe because I'm I'm older now too, is that I um when I see somebody who like is limping or they have something or, or it's whether they have a cane or something, I always of course still offer. And those people who are very um thankful, but again, like you said, 
sometimes there's people in certain age area gap that you don't know if you should or not. And, and, you know, it's, yeah, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, and I've also like, like even, even moms with baby with, with, with a strollers or stuff where yeah. I would run and, you know, yeah. carry the stroller yeah. or say, I help you. No, 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 no. Yeah. And it's like this, you know, they start to be embarrassed and that and I think that's why many people don't do it but then now comes what you said like uh for example my daughter has a help mark so it's this red mark that could help okay. that you put on the back or on, on what wherever and that shows I might need help or I you know I have problems uh standing for a long time okay i need to sit or okay. give me your help you know okay. and especially on trains so and my daughter has a help mark but when we get get on the train and we go to the area of, of uh seats you see these people who pretend not to see you know who have their smartphone in front of their eye ah, and here yeah, is the yeah. i i push my daughter <laughs> in front of these people so that that here swings the help mark and they pretend not to see it. And that's the other problem. Oh, I see. I see so that. So I, and I don't know how the cultural, this Kyotskal, yeah. so not introducing too much. Uh, so I think there is this one line when you get over that, then it becomes easily. Li, to be selfish or rude or however you uh, want to call it or ignorant or i see so when you're when your daughter she has that like sticker or that patch that shows that you know that she might need help those people on the train they can recognize and they know what that is then correct they should they okay. should i mean okay. many apparently many people still don't know that mark yeah, but it's, that... you know it's stick to the windows and that's what the, like the handicap seats right the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah 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 okay. yeah and... or the the disadvantage okay yeah. so i see so what you're saying is that basically people who kyot skow and all that create so much trouble that a lot of people just ignore it and then don't offer the seat but the reverse what happens is if everybody does that then people just become selfish and com complacent igno basically. well ignorant at least yeah. ah well that's interesting there's a lot of complexities here and also you know it could be like let's say me having a japanese face and you having more of a foreign face you know if you offer the seat you're going to get a different reaction than when i do so that's and true. being male and female will also be a different reaction age-wise or age you know so there's other dynamics that goes on through that yes. too but as you said whenever i see someone help someone like at the airport or pulling the suitcase off the luggage rack or whatever it's almost always a foreigner who is helping like an older japanese lady at the at the, at yeah. the baggage claim or whatever you know you don't see japanese men you know just jump in or you know very rarely i would say but again yeah that's that's i think a western concept of just helping right anything else that you find that you didn't really like or bothered you good or bad good things then again reliability here in japan or accessibility all of the train system <laughs> that's something again <laughs> you know in in germany oh my god well i think in europe in general you 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 are thrown out of the in the middle of nowhere, I'm sorry, the train doesn't, or they don't even say I'm sorry, but the train doesn't go on. You have to get off the train here. And we don't know when the next train is coming. And this can even happen with a, with an ICE. It ha I mean, it happens, especially here. We are on the Kosei Sen, which goes to a very uh, wind weak area in the northern area here, northern Shiga prefecture. So if there is wind, or if there is snow, the trains stop. But uh, first of all, we are acknowledged far long enough and they are really, uh, you know, trying to get other access possibilities or so it's very reliable, I think. So I guess we're talking about service, basically, right? Service when you compare basically. the service yeah. between Germany and Japan. Yeah. Tell me more about the service in Germany compared to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do I have to do this? <laughs> yeah, Joe, give us a couple of minutes of some of some some of your thoughts. Well, I think the in Japan it's like 
I've seen a few of your videos as well, or other YouTubers who uh, put the Japanese system, for example, of offices and public stuff or banks as like like they have so many little steps in between and you right. get a number and you have to wait again <laughs> and yeah. stuff like that. Right. And it's true, but it makes it work. Mm. So... You go to the bank, you have to write what you want to do. You know, I want to change money. Then you are, you get a number, you are called for the number, you give in at the counter, you give in your stuff and they give you another number and say, sit down and stuff. Where in Germany, you would go to the bank, you would say, I want that. Then you stand there and wait and wait and wait and wait for the money to come, right? So I think as a compound, the time you're at the bank is the same but it's just many more little steps in between. That is one thing. But the little steps in between make the system so perfect that there are hardly any mistakes happening. And so if something suddenly comes up, it still goes smoothly. And that's not the case in Germany. So it's it's chaos. And uh also like office for example just to get a, a residency so to to you know you move and you need to get a residency my son went to germany and he had to you have to get your residency within the first two weeks you move in so basically you say register that you now register. move and live in a certain exactly. area okay so okay you have to to do this whether you're a foreigner or a German person, it doesn't matter. You have to do this. If you move your your place of living, you have to get your resi this new residence. This is uh, at resi the city place. hall, at a city hall or at somewhere. At the city hall. Okay. Within the first two, two weeks you moved in. Of course, there's lots of paper stuff you need to download first and you need to get signs from everybody. Well, but then you need to get an appointment and it's impossible to get an appointment within these first two weeks so finally he got for example he got this appointment he had to go and line up at seven o'clock in the cold and he said there was a queue of hundreds of meters outside wow. Wow. to get in there and to finally get registered one and a half hours later and that's because there are just so few office hours and then there are i had to call a lot to germany like offices like this and then they have only office hours twice a week for three or four hours and only once a week on the phone the other two days are just like you know you can maybe write but you won't get an answer so on the phone you call, you don't get into the line. So from Japan, I have three phones where I, where I, you know, and which one will be in the line first? And then you're in the line and then finally you get someone on the phone and he says, I'm not responsible for that. You have to call tomorrow again. Things like that just do not happen here in Japan. I think they, they never happens to me. So of course, service wise, although a little bit more complicated and maybe you have more steps, you feel that no matter what, at least uh, it, it does happen. Things do happen and things are taken care of. What about basic like service, like uh, restaurant service or like um, hospitality and tourist service in Germany versus Japan? Well, okay, there, of course, the service is very good in Japan. But so one thing I think we Westerners miss is it's very uh, trained, you know, the, the speech. Even if I go to a restaurant where like a friend of my a classmate of my son's I know very well is working she would just be irashaimase itashimasu and she would talk this very very uh respectful language although you know I just know her from school and she would like and and then suddenly she is like like this yeah. you know but they have to do that and yeah. I myself I, I I used to work in restaurants and it was like you know that, that was really weird to me and 
uh, to just, you know, that that's a thing that I like in Germany. Like if you go even into a discount supermarket, every time you leave the cashier and however busy it, it was and however you have been pushed through, make fast, make fast. The last word is have a wonderful weekend or enjoy your day. So you always get this. And this is something I miss a little bit here. I think that's also the idea of small talk, right? Or casual yeah. talk. People who are in Japan, once you go into the system, you have to perform a different way and be very yeah. serious, you know, or like we talk about even like at the supermarket, right? I know in the United States, normally if you're waiting in line, you may talk to the person in front of you or behind you, you know, this is before COVID and, or to the cashier, you might say, Oh, you know, how's the tomato, the tomatoes were expensive or whatever you say. And there's, there's, there's kind of a small talk yeah. or in Japan, there's usually none of that at, you know, especially like a supermarket. If you started say, you started asking about how's their day going or, you know, something, they would like be just so shocked. Right. Because no one's talking like that because I guess if you, if you're if you're doing that, people would consider that you're not doing your job, right? You're not being serious. And yeah. I think in Japan, that's the hard part. You can't be serious and funny, you know, like you know, like in American presidents, like you know, like um, Obama. He, he used to always, you know, make a joke or try, you know, he's funny, and yet when he's serious, he's serious. You could kind of play on both sides, but mm-hmm. in Japan, you know, you don't see um, you know Kishida making jokes at any of his speeches, right? You know. Yeah, or you know, even Abe didn't. No one tried to be, you know, funny. Well, usually. if they would try, uh, they would have the paparazzi around, right? Yeah, well, that's that's true too. But the idea is that you know you got to be one or the other, black or white. I think in Western countries, you know, you can be both. You can be mm-hmm. kind of humorous, but yet when it's time to be serious, be serious. Yeah. Anything else you want to share that for these last thirty years that you've been in Japan that you think? you know, that either bothers you or you love or you want to share with people who may be coming to visit Japan or maybe who want to come and live in Japan or maybe who, who want to or maybe have an international marriage or anything you want to share? Well, I think like, you, know, like you, you uh, touched like international marriage before. And I think, well, it's it's already getting uh, normal, like normalized international marriages. It's It's not a big deal anymore. Although... Western with Asian is still more r- rarer, but I I think it's you know once you meet someone, whether it's as a friend, so once you are connected, it doesn't matter anymore, right? You you see the person as the person. If you don't see the person as the person, and you see the person as a as a foreigner or as a as a Japanese or as a Korean, then there is something wrong with that relationship, then it's not a friendship or not a partnership anymore, I think. So I think once you meet then it really doesn't matter. And that's regardless whether the other person speaks your language or not, I think. I understand so, what you're saying. But my question then would be is that, you know, when you're in love, you know, love at first sight and all that, you're very flexible. And of course, you want to make the other person happy and you put on your best face, et cetera, et cetera. But as the years go on, your value system that you've been raised in your cultural value system has to be part of you that has to have some effect on the relationship right but isn't that the case in any relationship would be my counter question i i agree but i think there's an extra layer with international marriage you know more so than let's say i married somebody from hawaii who who, who had the same thing and yeah there would be problems and, and etc but if i married somebody from japan let's say and if there's language you know like you know, Japanese don't usually say I love you all the time or that. Not that I expect it every time, but it would be nice to hear or something like that. You know, some expectations would be different. What do you think yeah, about that? Yeah, definitely. Like there are certain expectations that you have to lower, you have to adjust to or, you know, compromises to make maybe. Um, What's your secret? But- you survived. You know, you had a, you, you have a great marriage and family what, what well, do you for think? me it was never because my husband is Japanese or because I am German that certain problems arise mm-hmm. I think it's always that would happen if I had a German partner as well okay, okay. so you never felt any kind of layers of value system or thinking or mindset the the main thing what i really had a hard time 
uh, getting used to was like the, you know, Japanese working hours. So, and my husband coming back late, well, uh. For me, late. For Japanese people, it was, oh, how lucky your husband gets back between seven and eight. Oh. And for me, it was like my husband leaves the house at 7.30 and he comes back at seven or eight, you know. Yeah. And um Oh, they were saying you're lucky because their husband comes back later than that. He, later than husband, that. You know, your husband is coming back like, early. You know, their husband oh. would come back at eleven or I was oh. the last train available. Wow, oh, I see. And so and that was something where I really, really had a hard time getting used to. And I what think a, I never really got used to it. <laughs> what about like he I remember he was um transferred temporary on an ass assignment to Germany so the family stayed in Japan and you and and he went alone tanching funing they call it in Japanese right yeah what how did you handle that did you think that that, that was, was really that was really really good I mean it was my the, the kids were already big <laughs> and uh so I decided you know he he went to Germany pretty clear to pretty near to my hometown oh really and of course everybody in Japan and in the company they all were 100% sure I would go with him. Right, right. But I said, no, you know, <laughs> even if we, I, I don't know, if he would ask me, please come with me, I don't know what I would have said. For Thanks God, he, he, he left it up to me. Uh, but I said, you know, I built up my own school for so many years. I, I, I really, I worked hard to have what I have now. And it was clear that he would come back to Japan or at least not stay at that place longer than four or five years. So uh, why would I leave everything behind now? And then, you know, in four or five years, I would have to build it up all again. So wow. that was the decision I made. And then, well, I went, you know, we went back two or three times a year. My oldest son went for a whole year. And the, the days when we went back, like we had so much time together, we never had in Japan. Because he was working so much. Yeah. And because, you know, in Germany, so, you know, he, he would go to work well at nine, but of course we would meet somewhere for lunch and we would have lunch together. And then he would go back to work and then he would come back home very early from work and we would go out and have fun and have dinner and we would go for one or two weeks to to Spain or we went to Estonia we went traveling and things you know that were hardly possible or not possible here in Japan that is so interesting all of that that whole package because of course you know being from America also people would assume that yeah you would be going and that's your home country right so of course you would go if he's going to Germany but you said no because of the business you built and things and and in, in Japan it's just kind of accepted tanching funing where the husband goes and then the 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 wife and family stays mainly because of the education of the kids and that's just kind of a accepted practice but usually in the, at least the United States I don't know about Germany's the yeah. family or at least the wife would, would surely would go especially if the kids are a little bit older because you know it's a it's a couple kind of thinking right the society thinking right? so yeah your decision to just stay and not go into your home country I'm sure surprised a lot of people right yeah and then there's the reverse of that too is that you actually spend a lot more time, at least fun and leisure time with him when he's there because he's working so hard in Japan, but there he can take off two weeks or whatever. Like in Japan, like at the company I'm working at, people don't take off. They don't use their 20 days. They, you know, they, they you can accumulate up to, I think it was like 30 days to get 20 days a year or something. But then after that, it's just lost. You know, there's a law that says you're supposed to use it, but no one really abides by it. So I'm sure your husband too, being in a kind yeah, of a high yeah. management position, could never take this vacation. But in Germany, he could because it was the thing that, you know, everybody else was doing. So yeah. that's really interesting too, right? So lastly, Maggie, why don't you tell us about you have your YouTube channel? With my son. You have with your son. Funny, but it's in Japanese, correct? It's mainly for the Japanese market, right? Yeah. And I'll put a link down in the description. And also you have your website, correct? That I remember you were doing teacher training and things. Is that correct? Yeah. Tell us about your website. My website, it's, I've been a little bit lazy about that recently. So uh, my website is 
marketsacademy.com uh, I have one one part uh Japanese a, a Japanese blog and an English blog and the English blog is basically about it's a, education in Japan English education in Japan but also education in general and it's a lot about uh, my experience of teaching English to kids uh school being a school owner and tips for school owners and then the Japanese one is more towards parents but well also in general like a, a lot about I, I think mostly 80% is maybe about education and then about traveling or about Germany how do you do all of that the, the YouTube channel the website all of that I mean that's just like so much going on how do you have the time to do all of that doing I the school I ask myself I don't, I don't know <laughs> Well, I sometimes ask myself because I also I sleep nine hours per night. You know, I I need my nine hours sleep. Oh, you get nine hours. Good for you. Good for you. I get my nine hours sleep. Um, you take the bath. It relaxes you, and you sleep nine hours. Yeah, I think. Well, the main thing is probably that I do. I I never postpone things. So if I get a mail, I answer to it straight away. Yeah. Like yesterday, you you yeah. you contacted me the first time in a year yeah. and asked me, "Can you do this?" And it's like, okay, a few questions. Okay, when? Well, I need. Well, okay, how about tomorrow? You know, it's like. And, and that, that's that's really what I love about you because you know you 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 make things happen. You know, you know. I mean, not all Japanese, but there's a lot of Japanese people, like friends, even that if you want an appointment or you want to meet or you want to get together, it's like. They take out their little techo, their little calendar, and they, oh, like it's like in one or two months. You know, yeah, it's like yeah, it's like yeah. it's not like like with Westerners usually it's it's fast, especially if you have those like you who are like okay, stand and deliver. So right right away, right. Just yesterday, I I had some time off. I was off this week. I I sent you a message on Facebook Messenger. You answered. Yeah. You said, "Let me." Oh, I, you're gonna check right away. You said, "Oh, today you had some time." I said, "Great, set it up. Here we are." You know, yeah. that's like unheard of. If if this was like between a, me and a Japanese person, it would be like a whole project, right? Yeah. When, and the, and the, and the confirmation of the confirmation, and oh, you know, and uh, and all the questions they would have to do with you. It was like free flowing. I said, "Okay, we're just gonna make it free flowing because you're so easy to talk to, and you have so much." Um, interesting stories you know and i think that's what this is all about but as you said there's always exceptions to anything that we've talked about you know and and some of these are generalizations that we've made but on the other hand a lot of it is most of it is true in a sense and it's true because you experienced it so i i i thank you so much for being my first guest on this thank on this you YouTube for video. having me no, you're great. You're great. And that I, I hope that everything works out with the school and, and everything. And maybe in the future, we can come back again and you can come back and we can do another part too, because I'm sure you have so much that you didn't talk about today. But um, thank you so much, uh, Maggie Sensei, for being on this. And um, I learned a lot too, because I, I had a blank of 30 years with you. So I learned a lot today about what has happened in the middle. So Thank you very much. Arigatouzaimashita. Thank you very much. Arigatouzaimashita. Take care then. See you. Bye. So everybody, Maggie Sensei's YouTube channel and link will be down in the description. You know, if you're interested, you know, please follow her and, and her and her son do that YouTube channel, which is really, really cute. I enjoy it, especially if you speak Japanese or some Japanese. I think you really get a kick out of it. This is the Man in Japan channel. So please, if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. Hope that you like this video and we'll be doing more in the future. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you, Maggie. You. Bye-bye.